So first of all, let me just thank you for having me back so soon. Uh, I understand there was a, a bit of an emergency and I'm so glad that I'm able to step in. I'm hoping maybe someday I can actually get to Florida in person. Um, but for now, Zoom will have to do. And uh, this is kind of a special treat for me to be able to give this talk. I have a number of talks that I get to give, but I haven't given this one very often or very recently because uh, people tend to request other ones. But this is actually one of my favorites. So I, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and this is all about uh, a bird called the mystery owl of Mexico. And, and by the end of the evening, you will be well familiar with it. Um, we're gonna start with this question. What is an ornithologist's most essential tool? Now, most of you would probably answer that an ornithologist, at least a field ornithologist's most essential tool is binoculars. In the 21st century, that's probably true. But in the 19th century, a field ornithologist's most essential tool was undoubtedly a rifle. And ornithology took, took place in the 19th century down the barrel of a gun. And what, what the ornithologists did is they went all over the world and they shot every bird that they could get their hands on. And then they would put them in museum trays and put little tags on their toes and try to look at the birds on the tray and figure out where the species boundaries were. They would look at these birds and based on plumage and size and how they looked, they would decide, okay, these on here, these four on the left, that's one species. And these two on the right, they're a little bit smaller. They're a little bit yellower. And we're gonna call those a separate species. Uh, and what you're looking at here, of course, are barred owls, or at least the ones on the left are barred owls, a bird you're probably well familiar with in Florida. So originally, the, uh, in, in 1874, when Robert Ridgway wrote his History of North American Birds, this was what he wrote about barred owls. And notice that the scientific name of barred owl has changed in the past 150 years. Uh, now uh, we call it uh, Strix nebulosa, or sorry, Strix varia. Um, but at the time it was called uh, Cernium nebulosum. Uh, that's what we called the, the barred owl back then. And Robert Ridgway said, hey, there's three subspecies of barred owl. There's three different kinds of barred owls. This one he called the nebulosum variety from the eastern region of United States. This is the one you're familiar with uh, that we now call Strix varia. And then there was this one in eastern Mexico that he called sartorii uh, that had a, a slightly different coloration. And then there was this smaller one that was more tawny and yellowish called fulvescens down in Guatemala. And these were the three subspecies of the the one species that Ridgway called barred owl. And that's what this taxonomy looks like. Here's a map of these three different versions of the barred owl. Um, so this was Ridgway's taxonomy, where he had the northern barred owl, the Mexican barred owl, and the fulvous barred owl down in southern Mexico and in Central America. So the northern barred owl, you're probably familiar with what it sounds like. I'll play its call for you. Who cooks for you? Whoops, I guess I have to click on it. Did that audio come across well for people? Yeah, good. I remember to click the little button for that. And that's probably a very familiar sound to you in Pensacola, Florida. That's the Northern Barred Owl. Well, at some point about a hundred years ago, people went down to Guatemala and realized that those fulvous, so-called fulvous barred owls, they sing an entirely different song that sounds like this. And, <clears throat> My personal mnemonic for this is you, you're so cool, you're so cool. 
As you can tell, this is very different from what Eastern barred owls sound like in the United States. <laughs> so people decided that actually fulvous owls should be their own species because they sound very different. They look a little different. They're smaller. They're a slightly different color. They live in an entirely different part of the world in a very different kind of habitat. They live in mountain pine forests. And so they decided that fulvous owls were actually a good species. Strix fulvescens. And so then we had a taxonomy for 120 years that looked like this. The top two versions here are barred owls with a, an American subspecies and a Mexican subspecies. And then we have the separate species down here called fulvous owl in Central America. One of the reasons that we decided to split the fulvous owl is because of its different song. Uh, as you may be aware, owls do not learn their songs. Their songs are genetic. So they're gonna grow up to sing just like their parents did based on their DNA. So if you hear a bird, an owl, that sounds very different, it's probably a really good indicator that the DNA is very different, that it's a separate species. So we had birds who sing Who Cooks For You up in the United States. We had birds singing You Are So Cool down in Central America. What about those Mexican birds? Well, for 150 years, the answer was nobody knows. Nobody had ever heard a Mexican barred owl sing in the wild. In the book, Birds of Mexico by Steve Howell, if you look under voice of Mexican barred owl, it says Mex voice of Mexican form is undescribed. At the time that that book was published, he treated Mexican barred owls as a subspecies of the American barred owl. The Mexican barred owl, Strix uh, varius sartorii, is known from a few specimen locations all over Mexico in nine different states. I put, I put these points on the map to demonstrate all the places where a barred owl, uh, sorry, a Mexican barred owl was shot at some point in the 19th or 20th century. And if you look at the topographic map of Mexico, you'll notice something about all those locations. Mexico has mountains down the east side. They have mountains up the west side. In the middle is this high desert plateau that's gold colored. And then there's these lowland forests along the edges. You'll notice that the, the Mexican barred owl is a high elevation mountain bird. You'll also notice that the mountains stop here at the, at the point where Mexico gets the thinnest. We'll go back so you can see that. There is a, there's a break in the mountains right there and the lowland forests stretch all the way from the Caribbean to the Pacific there. That is called the Isthmus of Tehuantepec. That is the narrow part of Mexico and it's a biogeographic barrier. There are tons of high elevation birds that are found either north of it or south of it, but not on both sides because the mountain habitat breaks. And so very, very often we get a species boundary there. And that's where the species boundary was drawn between the fulvous owls to the south and the Mexican barred owls to the north. In 2010, owls were found at Cerro San Felipe in Oaxaca. That's a very famous birding site just outside of Oaxaca City. And it's, you'll notice that it's right here at the uh, north of the Isthmus of Tehuantepec and right in that habitat for Mexican barred owl. And people got very excited because finally somebody had located a population of Mexican barred owls. They seemed to be very rare and nobody was sure what they looked like or sounded like. And this was the famous photograph that ended up on the cover of North American Birds. But if you look at that photograph, you might notice something very distinctive about that owl. That owl looks quite a bit different from the barred owls that you might normally see in Florida. Notice how like rusty orange those streaks are on the front. Notice how kind of tawny and golden the facial color is. Also, the bird is pretty small. I don't know if you can really tell that here, um, but it kind of looks cute and dainty. And when they were listening to the audio of these birds, this is what they sounded like. <laughs> 
that is the you you're so cool you're so cool song of the fulvis owl now this was kind of a big surprise people originally thought that these must be mexican uh, barred owls but then they turned out to be fulvis owls and this is not supposed to happen because here now we've got Fulvus owls that are supposed to be south of this biogeographic barrier, south of the isthmus. Now we've found them north of the isthmus in a location <clears throat> where in the 19th century, the specimens that were taken there were of Mexican barred owls. So everybody got a little bit confused about what was going on. In 2011, a study was published on barred owl genetics and they, they actually took some DNA samples from each of these three populations and they found that there were big genetic divergences between all three uh, populations. And their paper, they said, we recognize three species, uh, the Northern barred owl, the Mexican barred owl, and the fulvus owl. So they actually said the Mexican barred owl by DNA should be a separate species from the American barred owl. Now this didn't quite resolved the question because they only had one very old DNA sample for Mexican barred owl. Their DNA analysis was fairly primitive compared to what we can do today. And a lot of people didn't find this study super convincing, at least with regard to this one finding that Sartorii should be a separate species. Michael Redder on the ABA blog criticized that paper and said, you know what, it's too soon to split the Mexican barred owl. We simply don't know enough about this bird. The, uh, the barred owl genetic samples were only from this part of the range way over here. And Michael Redder pointed out that now we have, we know that fulvous owls are over here in this part of the range. So maybe, you know, what's going on here? Are, are these all fulvous owls? And like actually the Mexican barred owl is a subspecies of the fulvous owl, or do we have three species involved? Or is there a, is there a difference between East, West, East, West, East Mexico and West Mexico? Nobody knew the answer to any of these questions. So in 2015, my friend Andrew said to me, let's go to Mexico. He wanted to go to Mexico and go on a birding trip. And when Andrew and I go on birding trips, we don't just like to see a lot of species, we like to do that too. But we like to uh, try to find answers to questions that nobody else is uh, looking for answers to, especially if they record, uh, involve recording bird sounds. And obviously it, since nobody knew what Mexican barred owls sounded like, this, this attracted us as a challenge. So we decided, in 2015 that we're gonna go and visit three sites in West, West Mexico where we think we might run into Mexican barred owls. Bocanieve, Cerro La Bufa, and Rancho La Noria. So we're looking for a bird at night that nobody has recently seen, nobody knows what it sounds like. It's a little bit tough. What we decided that we were going to do is we were going to go out and play the songs of barred owls from the United States and fulvous owls from Guatemala, hoping that the Mexican barred owl would be closely enough related to one of those two that it would respond to one of them. So you're familiar with the barred owl. And then there's that, you, you're so cool, you're so cool, of the fulvous owl. <laughs> so these were the sounds that we kept playing into the forest as we went from one site to the next after dark. So when we went to this place called Cerro La Bufa, we were playing these sounds into the forest and listening to whatever we could hear coming back. And at Cerro La Bufa, we heard a bird that sounded like this. Now that is not who cooks for you. And it's also not you, you're so cool. As soon as we heard this, We knew 
that we had heard a different species. We had heard a spotted owl. The Mexican spotted owl sings, what? You too, shoo. A fantastic bird, but not the one we were looking for. We went to the place called Volcan Nieve. And here again, after driving through miles of beautiful pine forest and playing the Bard Owl and Fulvis Owl songs into the night, we heard this. And as soon as we heard that, we knew that we were listening to an entirely different species, a mottled owl. Mottled owls are basically the most common owls in Mexico, uh, at least up in the forests. And you hear them all the time if you're out looking for owls or listening for them. On the last night of our trip in 2015, we finally got to this place called Rancho La Noria. And we were excited to come to this place because this was actually the only place where Steve Howell, the author of the field guide Birds to Mexico, had ever heard a Mexican barred owl singing. He said that he'd heard it way, way up on the mountainside behind the cabin, so far away that he couldn't get an audio recording, so far away that he couldn't really hear it very clearly. But he said that he, he was pretty sure that it had to be a Mexican barred owl and that it had sounded to his ear more like fulvous owl than like uh, American barred owl. So we got to Rancho Lenoria late at night. Uh, again, we had, to be at the, we had to be on a plane at like 6 a.m. the next morning. So we didn't have a lot of time. We, we dropped our bags in the room and uh, we decided we were gonna hike up on these trails that we had never seen in daylight. We're just gonna bushwhack into the forest with headlamps and play the sounds uh, you know, into the night. And as we got up to about our third stop, we were about a, a mile above the cabins on this, on this long track through the forest, uh, we heard this sound. The minute I heard this in my headphones coming from like a kilometer above me up in the, in the, <laughs> in the dark forest, this was one of the most amazing moments of my life because this is when I knew that we had finally found the mystery owl of Mexico. It's got that rhythm like, you, you're so cool, you're so cool, but it keeps going for a couple more notes and it's deep and low pitched like a bigger bird, more like a barred owl. This was, our target. This was the, the Mexican barred owl. And that night, uh, Andrew and I got the first ever sound recordings of a live Mexican barred owl. Uh, as we were hiking through the forest, we, we got one good recording of one bird and then it disappeared on us. We never saw it. Um, but as we, were, as we were standing there on the track and this bird had called and then vanished, we started hearing another sound off in the woods far away. And it sounded like this. And I thought, you know, that sounds like the female whale call of, uh, you know, a barred owl. And so that might be the female. And we decided, well, you know, whoever, wherever she is, she's calling from like half a mile away over this mountain ridge that's perpendicular off the trail from us. Are we going to, you know, leave the trail in the dark on this mountain we've never seen in daylight and just like hike down and up over the ridge? And the answer was yes. Yes, we were going to do that because this was what, what this was the only time that we were going to have. This was our last night of our trip. And uh, this was a very special opportunity. We hiked all the way down this ridge, up over the next ridge, down and then up again in the dark, using flashlights, bushwhacking through, you know, across logs and, and through, uh, through leaves. 
And when we got to the bird that was making this, this call, we found that it was not, in fact, a female Cenarius owl or Mexican barred owl. It was a baby. It was a, it was a begging juvenile, uh, a brancher. And it was constantly begging every minute or so. And it was super cute. And we thought, well, this is great because now we just sit here underneath the begging juvenile and pretty soon the adults are gonna come in to feed it. And we sat there for an hour and a half and that, ba that baby bird just begged and begged and begged and no adult was seen and no adult was heard. And we were getting very tired because it was like you know, two o'clock in the morning at this point. And we decided we should go to bed, hike back down to the cabins, get a couple of hours of sleep, come back up about an hour before dawn. We knew right where this baby bird was gonna be. And we figured at dawn, there was much more likely to be activity. And uh, we, we executed this plan and it worked. And eventually after some work, the adult finally came in. And this is the photo that we got of it. Now, this is a bird that you can see. It looks very, very much like a barred owl. When you look at them on the specimen table, like the dead ones in the museum, you almost can't tell the difference. But if you, if you know what exactly what to look for, there's a few subtle differences here. First of all, the voice is extremely different. But also, these dark lines uh, on the chest are very, very dark, almost black uh, in this bird. And the facial disc is very, very pale and almost silvery gray. And there's only a little hint of that kind of concentric circling inside the facial disc that is much stronger on northern barred owls. Uh, and so this, we decided, was a Mexican barred owl and it deserves separate species status. Because here's the different song. We finally had the proof that these birds sound different, which means they should be a separate species. Here's the barred owl again. Here's the full of a sow again. And in between, geographically, is this bird. Different pitch, different rhythm, different everything from either the, the barred owls to the north or the fulvous owls to the south. And so we decided that instead of calling it Mexican barred owl, we would call it Cenarius owl. This was a name that was proposed by Steve Howell. Cenarius means ashy colored, which is appropriate for such a, a pale gray bird, at least on the face. Uh, and we would call all of these um, scenarios owls because they're clearly not barred owls and they're clearly not fulvous owls. Now, that was just us. We found that bird, we, we recorded that bird uh, and we decided, well, we only have one bird. We have a sample size of one. We want to publish a paper and we want to get this species officially split. But in order to actually get the species officially split, you have to have peer reviewed research it can't just be a blog post. It can't just be an eBird checklist. You know, you have to you have to go out and find more of these birds and prove that they all sound the same. And you have to get a sample size and do an analysis. So in 2016, we were super excited. We decided we were going to go back to Mexico, and we were going to look all over the place for more scenarios owls. We tried to get to almost every place where a specimen had been taken, at least that we could find. And we were super excited to go back to a place we'd been once before called Planchinol. You'll notice that it's not a space where uh, there's a specimen, but it's right in between in the same mountain range. So we thought maybe we could get um, Cenarius owls here in this beautiful cloud forest uh, near Planchinol. This cloud forest is a little lower elevation than we normally would look for this bird. You'll notice there's basically no pine trees here. It's more lower elevation deciduous forest. Um, there's tons of amazing birds at Planchinol, like the strong-billed wood creeper and the hooded grosbeak 
and the Azure uh, Collar J, Azure Hooded J. Uh, but when we went out at night, all we got was modeled owls. Not too surprising again, because we were pretty low on the mountain, lower than we thought we should be, but uh, we didn't find them. We went to another place called La Trinidad uh, in the same mountain range. This was higher elevation. Here we got up into the pine woods. You can see the pine trees there behind this little tourist cabin that we stayed in. Uh, they, it, was, it was a wonderful place where they cooked us homemade like breakfast. Um, this is, you know, eggs, handmade corn tortillas, black beans, and this is nopal. If you're not familiar with nopal, um, it's a staple in rural Mexico. It is prickly, prickly pear cactus. They actually eat the green parts. Um, it tastes a little bit like a very mild uh, green pepper, like a green bell pepper. Um, and you actually can like get scale insects. These white scale insects uh, actually have dye in them. That's how you get these uh, blue dyes in the, in the cloths that they weave. We were super excited about La Trinidad because the cloud forest there was spectacular. It was wonderful, pristine. You can see how lush it is, uh, just how much moss and greenery and different kinds of species there are everywhere. Species of birds and species of insects all over the place. Uh, this is a stick insect that landed on our parabola. It was about eight inches long. And amazing birds like slate throated red starts and gray silky flycatchers and this uh, bronze winged woodpecker here. And even the critically endangered uh, bearded wood partridge, which we heard but did not see. But at night, all we could come up with were model owls and whippoorwills. Uh, we, we, if there had been scenarius owls at that site, which I think there should have been, uh, but if there had been, we probably would have heard them and we didn't hear a thing. We were excited to go to this spot uh, called Cerro Lucero because we knew that we could get to the exact site where, where two uh, scenarios owls had been shot in 1950. These are some of the most recent specimens in Mexico. Because um, we, we had good directions on the specimen tag. Uh, and we were able to look on Google Maps and figure out exactly where that was supposed to be, this place called Cañada Grande here. So we went up and figured out on Google Maps uh, where we were going and that there was this clearing up here, this road that would drive us right to the spot, right to the top of the peak where those specimens had been taken. Of course, you can see that it's been cleared here for cattle grazing. But we looked around it and it looked like, well, there, there looks like there's intact forest on the edges. So hopefully there might still be owls there. This, it would look deserty from down below, but when we got up top, uh, we got nothing uh, up there. It was, it was bleak. Uh, and we found that in that site, there was a theme that would be repeated almost everywhere we went looking for these owls which is that even though you might wander into forest and you'd find these huge trees, it was originally pine oak forest and you would find that almost all the large pines had been taken out by people and they would leave the oaks. And so the oaks would grow big and there might be a few pines that were still small and growing bigger, but it would be, it would be converted from a pine oak forest into a mostly oak forest and they would run cattle through the undergrowth and, it, and the cattle would eat basically everything. So there was no understory. There were no plants growing underneath the trees. And whenever we went into a forest like this, uh, we didn't find the, the scenarios owls. Sometimes we'd find whiskered screech, great horn, mottled owls, whippoorwills at night, but we would not find the scenarios owl. We went down to Oaxaca where there were protests against the government that blocked the road. That's a thing that happens in Oaxaca. We found this amazing cloud forest uh, in these areas where fulvous owls had been uh, taken in, uh, as specimens in the 1950s. And what did we find there? We found more fulvous owls. Uh, again, see the reddish streaks below, see the kind of uh, buffy golden face pattern. This is not a barred owl. Uh, every place we went down there in Oaxaca, Tototepec, more beautiful cloud forest and more 
Fulvis owls. No Mexican barred owls, no scenarios owls anyway. We went to Cerro San Felipe where the, <laughs> these yucca plants grow so big. That's me in that photo there. That, that, that yucca plant grew twice as big as me. This is amazing uh, place where the forest is really well preserved. And again, fulvis owls. Now note, this is the exact spot where in the 1870s people shot scenarios owls. And now there are no scenarios owls there and there are fulvis owls there. So it seems that what happened is that the scenarios owls have been driven out and fulvis owls are coming in to take their place. We don't know whether the fulvis owls are driving out the scenarios owls or whether the scenario cells all died and that, that left an opening for the, for the fulva cells to come in because the fulva cells are much smaller and you would expect them to be less aggressive. We don't know why this is happening, but apparently in Oaxaca where there used to be scenario cells, there are no more scenario cells and now there are only fulva cells. In fact, every record since 1950 that we were able to track down pertains to fulvis owl. So this is, a, this is not a recent phenomenon, but every uh, record from uh, the 19th century in Oaxaca is a scenarius owl record. So something weird is happening down there and, and more study is needed to find out what is going on. In 2016, we did not find any scenarius owls anywhere that we went looking for them. In 2017, I went back by myself uh, with my friend Manuel who lives in Mexico. We went to a whole bunch more places. This became a little bit of, of an obsession of mine. There's Manuel. Uh, and we went back to Volcan Nieve, got nothing in the morning, got you know stuff, but no scenarius owls. Uh, Volcan Fuego, again, no scenarios owls. The Aramo Viborus Road, some beautiful habitat, no scenarios owls. We went to a place called Puerto Los Masos, and no scenarios owls. A place called Cerro Viejo, we were very excited about because we, this was another one of those places where we knew the exact spot where some scenarios owls had been shot about 100 years ago. When we got there, this is what the forest looked like. This is not a pine oak forest. They had basically, you know, this is, this is an old clear cut where they had cut down all the trees and then let a bunch of second growth come back. And so there really was no pine forest left and we didn't hear much of anything that night. We even tried in Mexico City itself at a place called Desierto de los Leones where there's a bunch of pine trees. It was worth a shot, but nothing. We eventually said, you know what? We've been back to Mexico a whole bunch of times. We've been to almost everywhere that scenario cells used to live and we haven't found them. And so we're just gonna write the paper and you know, publish the research using our, our sample size of one owl with one recording. And we're gonna pair that with the DNA evidence from 2011 and try to convince the North American Classification Committee that they should actually split, officially split Cenarius owl out from barred owl. We submitted that proposal in 2021, uh, last year. And the result after the committee voted was that our proposal passed. And so Cenarius owl is now as of last year, officially a separate species from barred owl. Uh, as Cenarius owl is a Mexican endemic, it's found only in Mexico. And as far as we can tell, it may be critically endangered. It is at least beta deficient. Um, as of 2020, in the five years between when we found it at Rancho La Noria and, and the, the following five years, nobody saw any, saw or heard any scenario cells anywhere else in Mexico. We went we went all over Mexico looking for scenario owls. We didn't find any. If you want to see scenario owl or hear it, you can go back to Rancho La Noria, where we went. Uh, it's a well-known birding spot. It's really close to the town of San Blas, which is another well-known birding area. There are local guides who will take you up there at night, 
and you can see and hear Cenarius owls, they are still there. There's a robust population of them on that mountain, but it's one of the only places that we know of where they survive. So the mystery continues to be a mystery. Um, there are uh, my field guides, which uh, we talked about before, uh, I will say a couple things, uh, and then we can open it up for some questions. Um, one thing that I will say is that uh, a couple years ago, last year, I, I finally thought of looking on iNaturalist, the website iNaturalist, instead of just looking on eBird uh, to see if anybody had, had uploaded photographs or audio recordings of uh, Cenarius owls. And when I did that, I actually found that there were several people in Mexico who had actually observed Cenarius owls in the past couple of years at sites other than Rancho La Noria, including Volcan Nieve, which Andrew and I, between us, had searched three times for Cenarius owls, and we had not seen them anywhere. Uh, but apparently, they are still up there. And one of the problems, I think, the reason that we didn't find them is because we were not searching high enough on the mountain. We thought that we were supposed to search in the pine forest. So we were not searching lower down and we were not searching higher up. Uh, when we got to the place where the pine trees all get replaced by fir trees, we would turn around and come back down the mountain. And all the recordings and photographs of barred owls, uh, scenarios owls from Volcan Nieve are actually from much, much higher up in the fir tree zone. So that's higher than they had been previously reported, but it's also potentially good news because if there are uh, scenarios owls, if they can live in the, in the fir trees, the good news is there are lots of fir forests that are in pretty good condition in central Mexico. Um, these are the forests, if you've, been to, if you've been to this region, these are the high elevation forests where the monarch butterflies spend the winter, you know, hanging off the trees in huge mats. And because of the monarch butterflies, they've created some pretty good sized preserves in the, uh, in the fir forest. Nobody has looked at night in those monarch butterfly preserves for scenarios owls, but they might be there. Um, we thought that was too high of an elevation for them, but maybe they're all through there. And if so, maybe they're not as rare as we think. Uh, I hope so. Uh, in 2019, I got the chance to go to Guerrero, which is one of the most dangerous states in Mexico. You don't go there. Even my Mexican birding friends don't go to Guerrero very often, certainly not up in the mountains at night. Um, but I, I, I got a guide and, and who, whose ear was to the ground and we got to like get a really good handle on the local security situation. We were not able to visit the best sites at night because of security, but we, we were able to get within earshot of the best sites such that when we played our tape, if there had been owls up there, they should have called back down to us. Um, and we got nothing. We got, we got no scenarios owls there either. Um, so it, it's really not looking good for this species. Um, my hope for this species is that now that we have officially gotten it split, now that it is an official Mexican endemic species, I'm hoping that Mexican biologists and the Mexican government will start doing systematic surveys all through the mountains of Mexico and places where we haven't been able to get to, to really try to answer the question of how many of these birds are left and what is happening to them, why they have suddenly become so rare. They were not rare 150 years ago. People were shooting them all over Mexico, uh, the ornithologists, and now they seem to have disappeared from about 14 of 15 sites where they used to be common. Um, in addition, we need to figure out what's going on with fulvous owls apparently displacing scenarios owls in Oaxaca. Um, my guess is that what's happened is that people have cut down all the big pine trees, like I said, that they tend to do. And with the big pine trees go the big nesting cavities that these owls need. And they leave smaller trees with smaller nesting cavities. And so I think the smaller bird a fulvous owl, they can, they can nest in a smaller cavity, is potentially being selected for and benefiting from that situation. That's my guess as to why we now have fulvous owls in Oaxaca, where they never used to be, and we have no more scenarios owls there. 
Um, but it's a it's a it's a situation of great concern to me uh, because I'm worried about the future of this bird that means a lot to me because uh, of the experiences that I got to to have with it. So thank you for listening to me talk about this bird. And now I would like to open it up in case anybody has any questions. Thank you, Nathan. This, uh, I'm gonna look at the crowd here at the college first for questions. Nathan, this is Ethan. Hello. Um, so I was just kind of curious as to how you uh, started deciding that you wanted to investigate this bird and this, the whole situation with the owl and kind of where the inspiration came from. Um, that's a good question. Where did my inspiration come? Why, why this bird? Um, the main reason we were excited about this bird is because this bird was an, un, uh, an unsolved mystery. And that is exactly the kind of bird that Andrew and I gravitate towards. Um, we put together a trip to West Mexico with our friend Carlos Sanchez. And, you know, Carlos asked us at some point, he was like, what's the, what's the one bird that you really want to see on this trip? And Andrew and I both immediately said, in unison, Mexican barred owl, uh, or Cenaris owl, I forget what we were calling it at that point. Um, because, you know, it's great to see all those other birds, and I got a lot of other lifers, and there were lots of great recordings and photos that we took, but I just really, really love to uh, learn things that nobody knew before, and that's more interesting to me than going and seeing the same old birds or going and recording the same old songs. Um, I like to be able to break new ground uh, with my birding. And this was one of the few opportunities to do that, you know, close to the United States. Um, there's not too many birds of this type that are that have never been audio recorded or photographed as of 2015. And so that's really what motivated us uh, to go on. So, Have we got any other questions? Yes, sir. Yes, here's one. I'm Lucy. And um, I know that the Isthmus of Tehuantepec is a barrier there, uh, a presumed barrier. Um, and east of there, Triunfo, um, particularly on the Pacific side of Triunfo, uh, we passed um, on some hikes uh, down from uh, Triunfo through some pretty good uh, pine forests. Has there been any major effort in looking for the scenarios owl uh, there in Chiapas? Uh, as, as it happens, I was in Chiapas and I was at El Triunfo in March of this year um, for the first time I was, at, I was in that area. Um, and there are a lot of owls in those pine forests and they are all full of owls. And, you know, it was actually, you know, this this used to be the place you went to get fulvus owl before people knew that they were up in Oaxaca, uh, on the other side of the isthmus, and uh, nobody, as far as I know, has ever seen or heard or had any specimens of Cenarius owl from south of the isthmus uh, in Chiapas. The uh, it, it was kind of a dream come true for me in March to be able to lie in a tent in a sleeping bag and hear three different pairs of uh, model, uh, sorry, fulvus owls calling from three different directions um, in the forest uh, around the tent. That's, fulvus owls are thick through there. We, we probably had seven or eight of them uh, over the couple nights that we were camped out up there um, and no scenarios owls anywhere in that area, ever historically either, as far as anybody knows. We had them on five separate days up there at Tree and Foe. We had uh, visuals three days and and heard them every day, every night uh, that we were up there. So I was just wondering if there had been any search of scenarios there. Thank you. That's 
Thank you. Are there any questions from the uh, virtual audience? All I can say, but that was a fantastic trip. <laughs> Thank you for taking us on your adventures. I'm glad I could bring you along. Thank you for inviting me to do so. If anyone else has questions, you can just unmute yourself on your own system. <clears throat> you only get two repeats. <laughs> this is Ethan again. Um, I'm just curious, what is next? Is there anything your site's next that you're going after? Or is this kind of like, we're just going to keep going down this hole? <laughs> Well, you know, I got a little bit obsessed with this particular bird. You may have noticed that I keep going back to Mexico and I keep looking for this one bird. Um, I have uh, still never seen or heard it since that one night in 2015, uh, even though I've looked for it in, I don't even know how many sites now and how many states in Mexico. I've never been back to Rancho La Noria. Um, and so, um, there's lots more to do. Um, I mean, Andrew and I already did a couple of other things. We got the first uh, verified recordings of white fronted, uh, white chin swift, sorry, white fronted swift in Mexico that in that 2016 on that second trip. Um, there's a couple other birds in North America that have never been audio recorded. Um, but most of them are really, really difficult birds to audio record. Um, or they're basically extinct. There's not too many mysteries of this type left in North America. There's plenty more to do elsewhere in the world. Um, so I, I keep going back to Mexico. Andrew goes to you know places like uh, Armenia <laughs> and and records birds in places like that nowadays. That's where he goes to uh, to get his edge of the ed edge of the frontier, um, and then. Um, yeah, I've been I've been doing other things, but mostly just recording um, birds that are a little closer to home these days. Thank you. Any online questions? As I said, if you're online, all you have to do is unmute yourself and ask the question. I think silence is a no. Thank you so much, Nathan. That was fascinating. Thanks so much to all of you. The good news for our audience is that Nathan has several other uh, topics that he'd be happy to talk to us about. <laughs> so you may see him again soon. Thank you, Nathan. Have a good evening.